we take word of mouth for granted in every business. We just figure, hey, if we run a good business, people will talk about us. But that's not the way people behave. Hello, intelligent beings of this marvelous planet. Welcome to the 42 Courses podcast and thanks for listening. Jay Bear is a marketing, customer experience, and customer service keynote speaker. He's a New York Times bestselling author of six books, an internet pioneer, a seventh generation entrepreneur, and the founder of five multi million dollar companies. He's funny, factual, and fantastic. That's why, in 27 years of marketing expertise, Jay has worked with more than 700 companies, including 36 of the Fortune 500. Absolutely delighted to speak today to Jay Bear. Welcome, Jay. Thank you so much. Fantastic to be here. It's a real pleasure for me to speak to you because I'm just a huge fan of your books. And uh, yeah, it's really great. Um, so, Jay, for people who are not aware of what you do, um, tell, us, tell us what you do with uh, your company, Convince and Convert. I'm the founder of uh, Convince and Convert. It is a boutique strategy consultancy that works with leading brands across the world on digital marketing, social media, content marketing, customer experience, word of mouth. Um, it's a really fantastic organization. We're in our 13th year. I've actually been in digital since the very beginning, since 1993. So I've seen lots and lots of things uh, <laughs> since the very beginning. Uh, I'm the co-host of a podcast called Social Pros. Uh, I have written uh, six books um, and I love tequila and uh, plaid suits. <laughs> um, now I've seen you on, on stage on YouTube, on, I mean, some of those screens that you come out in front of, Jay, it's bigger than the Rolling Stones. I mean, <laughs> huge, the keynotes that you do. Oh, you know, some of those big events, it, it is amazing what they spend on AV, right? You know, like yeah. whatever they pay me is what like the cost is for butter, you know, or something, <laughs> but like the, the actual staging cost could be in the millions of dollars. It is, it is really something you're right. And is there, um, obviously that's been closed down, I presume for COVID, is there any of that coming again in the future? Yeah, actually, in as, uh, yeah, absolutely. As we chat, I have uh, two in-person events uh, coming up in the next week or so. Uh, both happen to be in, in Florida. And so it's starting to trickle back uh, in, in the States. You, you have uh, uh, events here or there. It's still a little, a little challenging uh, on, on scheduling, especially for the big events where people are yeah. coming from multiple countries with multiple uh, scenarios with regards to the pandemic, et cetera. So um, I've, I've spoken a lot to my agent and, and, and we feel like um, come the fall, right? You get into sort of September, October uh, timeframe, things will start to, to loosen up and get a little bit closer back to normal. But I don't think we'll ever, personally, I don't think we'll ever uh, have as many events for business as we had pre-pandemic because some of the smaller events, I think we realized like, you know what, well, we could just do it on Zoom and it'll be fine. Yeah. Well, I hope to see you live in person one day. Me in too. States, or Me maybe too. in Europe even. Yeah, I would love to come. But I know you um, through your books, really. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a theme, a running theme, I think, through them. And that's empathy and caring. It's a massive thing in your books. And I wanted to ask, uh, is it that you are just a big, softy teddy bear underneath your digital marketing experience? Maybe, maybe. No, you know what I think it is? Uh, I'm a seventh generation entrepreneur. My son's an eighth generation entrepreneur. Right. My family's been self-employed since the, the early 1800s. And the number of times that I had a conversation with my father or my grandfather about the need to treat customers with dignity and respect and kindness and humanity, literally zero times, never once. Because I am old enough to remember that that used to be the default setting, right? That, that's just how you did it. Right? There wasn't even a name for it. You didn't, there, no one walked around talking about empathy in business 30 years ago because, of course, you would be empathetic to customers. They're giving you money. But somewhere along the way, I think we kind of lost our way. And we find ourselves where we have been in the last decade or so, which is in an era of empathy deficit, where it's no longer the default setting, it's not even commonplace anymore to treat customers with kindness and dignity and respect and humanity. And, and that kind of makes me sad actually a little bit as a, as a consumer myself, but I will tell you, and I talk about this in my books, it is a tremendous business opportunity because when you treat customers better than they expect, and they expect very little right now, 
if you treat them better than they expect, that has manifest economic wins for your organization, right? This isn't just, no. wow, it feels good to treat customers well. Yeah, it does, but I wouldn't write a book about that. I'm a business consultant. I'm not a pastor, right? So, so yeah. yeah, it feels good to treat customers well, but it makes financial sense to treat customers well. And, and all of customer experience is about expectation management, right? If you, if you meet or fall short of the expectations you've lost, if you exceed the expectations, Expectations you have won. That could be the whole book right there. It's one page. Yeah. And uh, as you say, it makes financial sense. And the examples in your books are like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't everybody do that? But um, how, how, does, how does this empathy thing, as you say, generations past, it wasn't really there, the empathy. How does it play in the States now where dollar is king more so than perhaps uh, in Europe? How does it play when you're selling this uh, to big corporations, yeah. is it like do you get pushback? Sure, of course, uh, because there there are scenarios where it takes more time, money, effort to treat customers um, well than it does to treat them shabbily. Uh, and and so if you start thinking about that on a per customer basis, you have to prove out the business case that says, all right, well, if we go to the trouble of treating them well, that will impact their uh, net promoter score or, or, or lifetime value or some other kind of metric that the company cares about. And if you scale that out across the enterprise, then it's not a cost, it's an investment. And ultimately, I talk about this in my book. One of the biggest challenges we have in business today is that even now in 2021, customer service is still treated most often as a cost, not as an investment. And, and that's just yeah. like a fundamental challenge with how business thinks about that part of the relationship. So Jay, that leads very nicely onto um, my first uh, re interaction with you, which was Tort Triggers, which is, I absolutely love this book. It's a quake book for me, split the ground open, fantastic examples of how to do um, business and marketing. Now, I think I saw it first in an airport because I saw the llamas on the cover, its own <laughs> Tort Trigger. Yes. Um, it's so well researched. There's so many great examples. How long did it take you to write this book? Uh, it's. It, I wrote it with my good friend, Daniel Lemon, who used to lead the strategy team at Convince and Convert. So it definitely is a joint project that made it a lot easier to have both of us working on it. And we kind of split up uh, sections of the book and research and, and things like that. I, I actually had coined the term talk triggers uh, several years before in a series of blog posts that I wrote for the Convince and Convert site and and then sort of fleshed it out into a into a full book so once daniel and i decided to all right we should write this book uh and then we wrote it it was probably six months maybe a little less um uh to, to kind of put it all together but you're you're right when i when i create books to me obviously you got to have a point to the book and, and sort of a what advice are you giving and why does anybody care? Uh, but, but to me, it's all about the examples, right? It's all about the case studies. And, and one of the things I really work hard on, in fact, you might appreciate this, I literally have a, a, a grid that I use and it says, okay, big company, small company, B2B, B2C, US, global, right? And I sort of try to play bingo and, 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 and check all those boxes because I don't want a reader to say, well, I've already heard this one. It's about Starbucks or Apple or some other kind of globally famous company, or um, this one isn't relevant because I don't live in America, or this one isn't relevant because I'm a small company. I never want a reader to be able to say that. So I literally have to throw out some good stories to, to pull in other stories from sort of a different dynamic so that nobody feels like the book isn't for them. Yeah. And um, actually, I was speaking to two other authors uh, recently on this podcast and speaking about how they actually started the process. And um, interestingly, Simon Lancaster was saying that the, the really important thing is to get the title and the subtitle and the back cover. That's how he starts it and approaches the publishers. Is that, what, is that your method? Um, no, not really. Uh, I, for me, I, I start with... Um, a speech, actually. Um, I write books quite a bit differently than most people. So I will first write um, a, a, a keynote speech, a 60 minute speech um, in, in Talk Trigger's case about word of mouth and the power of word of mouth. And then I'll go out and I will deliver that speech 40 times um, to an audience. 
and each time I'm including new examples and then I see what the audience reaction is to different examples. I'm changing the structure of the talk a little bit, um, working on the mental model, the framework, the mnemonics, things like that. Uh, and then after I've done it 40 times or so, then if it goes well, then I turn it into a book. So I always start with a speech and then make it a book, which is why it's a little faster to do that for Daniel and I to take talk triggers, which is already uh, you know, a speech that I had been giving and turning it into a book as opposed to doing it from scratch. Uh, I find that you end up with a book that has a really strong narrative flow because it was born from a narrative, right? It was born from a speech that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So that's just the way I do it. Well, it's very, very successful. Um, now, the favorite examples in the book, I mean, it's difficult to name some favorites because there are so many and they're so great. Um, some some of mine are the dentist surgeon who calls before because that's just yes, a Glenn Goran. and he's never been uh, sued litigated I and mean, yes. that's just incredible isn't it because uh, so many people are um, in the medical industry uh, are victims of uh, you know litigation and stuff holiday world which i know is close to your heart because it's close Indeed. to your home it is and uh, with their free drinks which is yeah. so counterintuitive and so brave and um and I think Skip's Burger with the Joker in the pack, which is just amazing. Would you, would you like to talk about any of those or even You're your happy favorite? to? I can I can touch on all of those. Um, you know, you know, we talk about empathy being important, and I think Dr. Gorab is a good example of that. He's a. I just met him. I gave. I talked about this idea of doing the speech first. So, I did the talk trigger speech to a dentist's conference. And he came up to me afterwards and said, hey, I think I already have a talk trick. I'm like, well, that would be amazing and somewhat unprecedented because you're a dentist. Uh, and he told me the story. And I was like, yeah, that's amazing. And then I ended up including it in the book. And so he um, operates in in sort of in New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, that sort of part of the U.S. where it's very um, densely populated. There's 400 or so uh, other dental surgeons that do the exact same thing, right? It's not like somebody's got a secret sauce. Like he does the exact same thing. They all do the exact same thing. They all charge basically the same amount of money. Uh, there really is no advantage other than I guess proximity. I mean, most people pick an oral surgeon based on how far is it to my house or how far is it to my place of business? Cause I don't want to drive, especially in, in the traffic in that part of the US. Well, he's got a totally different thing going on. So every Friday, his office staff gives him a list of names and phone numbers. And on Saturday, he just calls them from his cell phone when he's just like around the house or on a walk. He's like, hi, this is Glenn. I'm your oral surgeon. I understand that you're coming to the office for the very first time next week. Before you get here, do you have any questions that I might answer? And people are dumbfounded, right? They're, they're flabbergasted. You know, if you've had an oral surgery procedure, right, you've had a wisdom tooth out or a root canal or something like that, um, it's possible that if you have a good surgeon, they'll call you afterwards. Yeah. Brent, how's it going? How's the pain, man? Are you bleeding to death? That's what they ask you. Uh, but you've never had a physician call you before you ever set foot in the office. It's just, it's simply not done. But it should be done because Glenn reports that that almost every patient mentions the phone call when they're in the chair. He's in their mouth. Like, Thanks for calling me. Uh, and then every day, somebody calls into the office to make an appointment. And they say something along the lines of, I have to drive way out of my way. I have to pass up a bunch of other oral surgeons that are closer to my home. But I want you to be my surgeon because you're the one who called my friend Shirley before she ever came to the office. It's such a simple way. To, to turn something that people don't talk about, like dental surgery, into something they do talk about. And, and that's the, the key here, right? Is that, is that we take word of mouth for granted in every business. We just figure, hey, if we run a good business, people will talk about us. But that's not the way people behave. That is not how it works. Competency is important. If you're not competent, you're not gonna have a business. But competency doesn't create conversations. We don't talk about things that are good. We don't talk about things that meet our expectations. We only talk about things that are outside our frame of expectations. And that's why being called by the dentist before you ever meet the dentist is so outside your frame of reference that you're almost forced to tell other friends about it. Yeah, and it's that uh, it's that nonconformity that makes volunteer marketers out of your customers, isn't it? 
It is, it is. But I think it's important, Brenda, to point out that this is not this is not about stunt, right? So there's a mm-hmm. there's a there's a fine but incredibly important line between a word of mouth strategy, like Dr. Gorab implies, which 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 pays benefits to his business every single day, versus um, kind of shock and awe and and kind of public relations stunts like let's go rent an elephant and put a logo on its flank. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. And, and people conflate those a lot. They think that word of mouth equals a big spike in conversations. And that's not what we're doing, certainly not in the Talk Triggers book or the or the work that we do for clients. It's about building a sustained level of conversation where your customers do become volunteer marketers. And that doesn't require some sort of random silliness, right? It's It's just having a good strategy and staying with it. And that's that great framework that you put in the book. I, I'm not going to give it away because I want people to read the book, but the four, right. five, six framework. And yeah, well, if you go remark- to talktriggers.com, there's tons of free resources there, including the framework. So obviously, Daniel, and I would love for folks to buy the book, but um, if you go to talktriggers.com, there's a tremendous amount of resources there. Please, they're, they're yours for the taking. And, but the, the first thing is that in that framework is the remarkable, relevant, reasonable, and that's repeatable. Right. And that's what is so fantastically illustrated by Holiday World by you, right? Oh, Holiday World is it re- remains one of my favorite businesses of any kind, and it's not because they're you know an hour down the road. They, they just refuse to play the game the way all their competitors play it. They're a, a, a amusement park, theme park, um, has a combination water park and kind of regular, right? So they've got roller coasters and like water coasters. It's sort of a, a hybrid. Uh, they've been around for decades and decades and decades. Family owned. Um, as you probably know, especially in uh, the theme park business, one of the ways they make a lot of money is on food and beverage. Yeah, he'll charge you for a ticket for admittance, but uh, you know it's a thirteen dollar you know soda and 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 you know eight dollar bottle of water and you know it, it's a it's expensive. They do it the exact opposite. They decided to give away drinks, free drinks, and they've got these little huts all around the grounds. And you go in there and you can get whatever you want and any sort of soda, soft drink, iced tea, maybe even coffee. Although I don't know why you'd want to drink coffee in holiday world, but you can, I believe. Uh, and it's completely free and, and it saves their customers so much money. But again, it is so outside the frame of reference for what you would expect from a theme park that their guests talk about it all the time, right? If you, if you look at the reviews for holiday world, uh, on TripAdvisor or Google or anywhere else that you might find reviews for that kind of place, they invariably mention the free drinks because it's, of course, you would say that. And it, what's hilarious is they've spent, you know, I don't know, half a billion dollars on rides. And the thing that people talk about is a free soft drink that actually has a cost to them of like five cents, right? The, the actual cost is not significant. They forego a lot of profit because they're not charging $13 for a drink, but their estimation is we make it back and then some in the free word of mouth. And and that's, again, you've got to think about this as an investment, not as a cost. Yeah. And the, and Skip's Burger, um, that one is so brave. And, and you speak in the book about like a, a, yeah. the reactions to that from- Oh, they hate them. Everybody in the theme park industry hates Holiday World. Yeah. <laughs> because then you go, to, you go to Disney or, you know, name your theme park. Um, and they're like, well, wait a second. These guys give me drinks. They also have free sunscreen, by the way, and free parking, which is wow. all of those are amazing. Um, and, and you go somewhere else, you're like, well, these guys give away drinks. And so, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not well uh, liked uh, by their theme park peers. That's for sure. Uh, Skip's uh, is a really interesting story. Um, so Skip Wall and his wife used to uh, run uh, a, a regional chain of uh, fast casual restaurants in Northern California, decided they want to do their own thing, entrepreneurial dream, going to open our own restaurant. So they did. Um, and they, it's a pretty simple concept, right? It's, it's mostly burgers, really good burgers, but mostly burgers. Uh, and it's counter service. So no waiters or waitresses. You order off a menu board, and then they bring your food out to you uh, when it is uh, finished being prepared. Well, they wanted uh, people to, to be able to do something while they were in line, because that kind of business always has a line at the front because you got to wait to order off the board. Um, and so they wanted something to give, you know, something to do during the during the line. And they thought about having televisions and other things. They said, oh. 
So he just decided on a whim, hey, let's just try this. And so the way it works is you order your meal. You want a, a burger and some fries and a, and a, and a chocolate shake, et cetera. Uh, and, and after you've ordered, but before you pay, the front counter person from underneath the counter whips out a deck of playing cards, fans them out face down in front of you, and looks you right in the eye and says, pick a card, which is not something you typically hear in a burger restaurant. Uh, you're like, okay, and you pick a card. And if it is a joker, uh, your entire meal is free, whether you'd ordered for just yourself or you've got seven friends with you. Now, everybody who orders gets to play this game, which is one of the reasons it works so well. It's not just on your birthday. It's not just when it, on Tuesdays when it's slow. Uh, it's every person, every time. Now, on average, Skip told me that about four people-ish for approximately a day win this game. But when they win, they go nuts, right? They're calling their mom, they're crying, they're putting, you know, posts on Instagram, like it's a whole thing, right? Confetti cannon, whatever. Um, and, and it propels so much word of mouth for the business. And in fact, they have this giant neon sign out front that says Skip's Kitchen, it's the name of the restaurant. But nobody in Sacramento, California, where it's based, they, they don't call it Skip's Kitchen. Everybody calls it that Joker restaurant. Yeah, and that's a pretty powerful word of mouth statement when nobody even knows the name of your business. <laughs> they only know the name of your talk trigger. It's just so clever. And it's it's gamified. And it's not even digital. You know, everyone's so obsessed right. with gamifying digital experiences. It's so that? true. So true. it's so simple. And, and it's one of the it's one of the examples. And I have hundreds of examples now. Uh, in fact, my talk trigger show my YouTube show that um, that details uh, talk triggers ideas has a bunch of different ones that aren't in the book. And I've got lots more even since I stopped doing that show. Uh, so I have literally hundreds of examples. But but the one about skips, the one we just talked about, is one that that I include in almost every presentation because it's just so easy to see like why it works, how it works. You're like, oh, I get it, right? I, I actually lead a lot of presentations with that one um, because it, it's it just so so simple for the audience to, to understand what I mean and also what I don't mean. So I like that one a lot. And these are ones that, we, that we've spoken about here just now are like small enterprises, but there are, there are other examples of the bigger corporates. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely, there's, there's lots of big company examples. Although I will say um, that it is typically easier for small and medium sized businesses to execute on a talk trigger because it does require some degree of bravery um, and courage and, and big companies feel like, well, we don't need to do that. We can just win by spending more money on ads or, or, you know, having a lower price or, or some other kind of weaponry. Um, and, and so there's no doubt that, that some of the best examples tend to skew smaller because it's just easier for them to do it. Yeah. And, we're just conscious of time. I, I want to move on to, even though I love talk triggers and could talk about it all day, I want to move on to Hug Your Haters as well, sure. which is another book absolutely filled with empathy, like how to turn your customer service into a competitor advantage is, is yeah. kind of what it's about, right? Would you, right. Yep. Would you want to speak about the, uh, the disparity between companies who think that they have great customer service? And then <laughs> yeah. Those who actually yeah, did. that was uh, some research from Bain that came out um, and that said that that uh, eighty percent of companies, when you ask them, say that they deliver superior customer service. Eight percent of their customers agree, and I think that really says it all about the state of customer service. Like, you know, businesses are like, well, what's the problem, right? And and customers are like, are you kidding me? It's nothing but problems. Uh, and I'm having a couple of customer service challenges right now with some businesses. And it's like, man, too bad these guys don't know. I wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> They'd probably be calling me back. They might be in the next book. Uh, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny in that way. Uh, you know, and, and one of the things I see all the time as a consultant is, is companies will say, well, Jay, you know, this doesn't really apply to us because we don't get that many complaints. And what I always have to remind them is nobody gets that many complaints, right? The, the data show that for every 100 dissatisfied customers, okay, they're already unhappy, 100 unhappy customers, only five will actually complain. Five out of 100, the rest just stop giving you money and they, and they talk about you behind your back, 
So this idea that well, we don't get that many complaints, therefore everything is fine, actually doesn't hold water uh, mathematically. Um, you know, even the best companies uh, and even the worst companies don't get that many complaints as a as a share of total customer volume. So it's not a reliable metric to gauge how well you're actually doing. And, and the fundamental premise of the Talk Figures book is that um, it's shocking, even today, um, how often customers have a question, comment, challenge, complaint, and they are ignored. Yeah. And this has happened to almost everybody at some point in their life, right? They have tried to communicate with a business and they've heard nothing but silence. I'm experiencing this right now, as I mentioned. In 100% of the cases, that makes you feel worse about the company, not better, right? Yeah. It's not like, well, I'm sure glad they ignored me. I can't wait to give them more money. Uh, said, <laughs> said nobody ever. Uh, so this idea that that businesses should somehow uh, pick and choose or or let's only answer the most unhappy customers or or somehow try and sort customer contact by, um, you know, by any mechanism is is wrong. Uh, and we did a tremendous amount of research in that book and found quite clearly that if you reply to a customer, even if you can't solve the problem, right? If you just respond, it has a tremendous impact on customer retention and customer advocacy. So it, as a consultant, we find all the time circumstances where businesses say, well, what percentage of your customers do you actually reply to? 32%. So the other 68%, you're just like, well, I guess they're gone. We'll replace them with new customers through more advertising. It's just a flawed way to run a business. And, and um, it's interesting that that book and the principles in that book, which is essentially customer service is marketing. Yeah. I had really hoped that by now would no longer be relevant. And sadly, it's as relevant as it's ever been. And yeah, you say that, so like that, that overt five out of a hundred who are actually complaining, this, this is the, the point that you're making that customer service is the new marketing because it's a spectator sport now. Oh, absolutely. And more now than more in the last year than ever, right? That, that so often our interactions with customers take place in public, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or, or Google reviews or any number of other places, you know, it used to be in the day. Um, customer had a complaint, it was phone or face to face or even a letter. I remember writing complaint letters when I was younger. Uh, nobody does that anymore. And so the, the, the economic consequences of your customer service approach transcend the economic value of the customer with whom you're interacting. Because if you've got dozens or hundreds or maybe even thousands of other customers or prospective customers watching this play out uh, in social media or a review site, it's not just, you know, how much money are we going to win or lose from Bren? It's how much money are we going to win or lose from Bren and all of his friends, right? Um, which could be significant. And so uh, you, are, you are on stage uh, in customer service in a way that you didn't used to be. And yet yeah. um, companies haven't fully, I think still today, in most cases, funded customer service uh, as if that were the case. Yeah, you say, you say in the book, when you respond, you're actually not responding just to the person, you're responding to the whole of the earth. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, at yeah. least in theory. Um, you, know, you don't know who's, who's tuning into your Twitter exchange or whatever the circumstances are. Yeah, now like in Talk Triggers, where you've got the, uh, the great four, five, six, in, in Hug Your Haters, you've got these great mnemonics, the, yeah. the hours and the fears. Again, yeah. I don't want to give those away, but just because just you, you spoke about social media just now or, or yeah. a, a review sites, I think there's a really, really interesting one for people to hear about, which is the R in there's hours and fears and the R in fears is reply only twice. Can yes. You tell yes. us the secret of that one. Yeah. So we, we did some research on this and I've also experienced it uh, both as a consultant and as a human being. There is a tremendous diminishing returns principle once you <laughs> interact with the customer uh, three or more times. Mm -hmm. um, what, what often happens, customer says, you know, I hate you. You reply back, terribly sorry. Um, what's wrong? It doesn't matter what's wrong. I hate you. <laughs> okay, well, um, that's unfortunate. We'd love to talk to you about that, phone, email, et cetera. They come back. I don't want to call you. I just hate you. At this point, you trying to convince them to call you is not going to work, right? They've already expressed their intentions. They don't want to interact. Um, too often I find businesses 
look at that kind of exchange wrong. They think they're going to somehow turn this customer around or or win the engagement, and they're not. Uh, again, understanding that this is on record, in many cases, it's public, it's on a public website. Um, you just want to demonstrate your values, not necessarily to that customer, because they may be too far gone, but to everybody else who's watching this interaction, right? You're demonstrating your values, you're demonstrating that you care and that you're accessible and, and available and a human being. Um, and then you just move on, right? It, it, it's, it, it wastes so much time getting into these counterproductive, like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like 11 exchanges. Um, if, if, if they don't take the bait to, to engage after two replies, stop replying because nothing good's going to come of it. Yeah. And in that public forum, you've shown that you are reasonable enough to say, let's yes, have a- yes. You've, you've shown not only that person, uh, who probably doesn't care if you're reasonable, they're just mad. Um, but you've shown everybody else that you're reasonable and that's what you're actually trying to do. Yeah. Now, Jay, uh, what, what's next for you in terms of book writing? Is there something in the um, oven? You know, I, I'm not certain. I've got a, um, a a speech, as I said. I always start with a speech that I've been giving for the last uh, year or so uh, called The Coveted Customer Experience, um, which is all about what customers care about disproportionately and the fact that customer experience doesn't actually exist. It's just a nickname that, that we've um, adopted that actually is used to describe hundreds of different decisions that you make in your business every day. So I've been, I've been working on that and, and uh, that may become a book. If I decide to write another one in the near future, it'll probably be on that topic because it's, it's sort of at that point where I've got it polished and ready. Uh, I'm just not certain I want to dive into the book writing phase. It's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and, and you know, a lot of my friends who write books kind of shut things down. They're like, all right, I'm going to take three months and basically just write a book and I can't do that. I have too many other things to yeah. do. Uh, and so I end up writing books only nights and weekends. And that's a, that's a commitment um, uh, for me and for my family that I'm not quite ready to make again just yet, but uh, one of these days for sure. Okay. Well, I will certainly be reading it if it comes out. Thank you. Future. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can we, can we finish with some uh, little bit left field questions? Some of course. fun questions. Um, if marketing were a food, what would that be for you? If marketing were a food, what food would it be? Um, probably popcorn, I would say. Uh, it is, um, uh, it's, it, it can be fun. Uh, it can be uh, noisy, uh, but it's not terribly nutritional. <laughs> and if marketing were a song? If marketing were a song, I like these questions. If marketing were a song, um, I would go with um, Don't Stand So Close to Me by the Police. Um, I, I sort of feel like it, marketing gets harder and harder because uh, audience attention becomes more and more fragmented. Um, and instead of trying to increase relevancy, marketers tend to increase um volume. And, and I'm not sure that's a, a sound strategy. In fact, one of the most harrowing statistics I've discovered recently, uh, I believe this was, it's either Gartner or Forrester, apologies to them for not having it correct, uh, found that in 2021, projected a 40% increase in the total volume of marketing mes- uh, mentions. Wow. 40%. So nobody is like, as a consumer, like, man, you know, it'd be awesome this year coming out of the pandemic, it'd be great if I could get 40% more marketing messages. <laughs> that would be awesome. So uh, don't stand clo- so close to me by the police. That's my answer. Okay. Now I have to uh, give credit where credit's due. I got these questions actually from Rob Stevenson, who was on the previous podcast, who's a mental health campaigner and has uh, some great questions like this. Rob Stevenson Bravo. from Form School, great guy. Uh, and the final question that I ask everybody, um, you have to fight between a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses, which do you choose to fight and why? Okay, so it's a horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses. Um, I always feel like numbers gives you more strategic avenues, right? You can, 
you can you know align your resources in different ways you can outflank um uh, a giant duck etc so i'm going to go i'm going to go with the numbers i'm going to say 100 uh, duck sized horses okay well i mean if you just look at i mean just watch any nature documentary right and you see you know a swarm of ants taking down a bird or something right i think i think the answer exists in nature <laughs> Very good, very good. Jay, thank you so much for your time. I know you're super busy. Happy to do it. Take care of yourself. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye. Sure. What a voice he has, right? If you go to jbear.com, that's J-A-Y, and bear is spelled B, A for alpha, E for echo, R for Romeo.com, not like the bear in the woods, you can sign up to his bi-weekly newsletter. His consulting company you can find at convinceandconvert.com and check out Jay on his Social Pros podcast, the Talk Triggers video show and the Standing Ovation podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time.